Welcome once again to Northridge. Welcome home. We're glad that you have chosen to uh, spend part of your weekend with us. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, Webster Campus, Rochester Campus online, we're glad you're here. My name is Nate. I'm our Webster Campus pastor and excited to have a chance to continue us along together in this journey we've been in the last five weeks where we're in this series called Against All Odds. And this is really a series that's around one word, and that is the word trust. And we are looking at individuals found in God's word where God shows up in their lives and uh, invites them into an opportunity uh, for him to work in and through them. And are they going to trust? Will they trust? And what does that trust look like in, in their lives? And before we dive in too deep to our, our talk today, I thought I would start by really just talking about um, the plan that God has for your life, the purpose that God has for your life. Did you know that? Did you know God has a plan for your life? And maybe for some of you, you hear that and you're like, oh, I don't know that I like that. That kind of sounds a little weird or I'm not sure I really feel okay with that. And, and maybe part of that is because maybe even unknowingly, you kind of have this relationship with God or view of God that's kind of like maybe that, that friend that you have that whenever you see them or they call, like they just always want something from you or they yeah, are desiring something from you, right? You know the person, man, if they, that name shows up on your phone and you see it and you're like, that one's going to voicemail. <laughs> I'm not going to pick that up because if I do, it's going to be an hour-long conversation or they're going to want me to do something, and so I'm, I'm just going to pass on that. Or the person you see, you know, in Wegmans as you're shopping across the store and you see them, and you're like, oh, all right, I'm going to head down this aisle. I want to make sure I avoid that person because, man, again, they're going to want something from me. And I think sometimes, again, unknowingly, we kind of view God this way. And we want to be close enough to God, like I want to be close enough to experience his blessing and the blessing of heaven, but not total access and total surrender, because if I do that, well then, he's, he might make me move to, to China as a missionary or something, or he's going to ask me to give up something I don't know that I can give up, or to do something I'm not sure that I'm, I'm ready to do. So what, it ends, what ends up happening is we hold back, and as a result, we just really don't trust him fully and completely with our lives. And so that's what we've been talking about throughout this series. And we started um, in Genesis as we looked at Noah and God comes to Noah and asks him to do something he's never heard of or even done before and building an ark. He comes to Joshua, a young leader over the nation of Israel, and it invites him to step out in faith and trust him as he leads him into battle against Jericho with a military strategy that no general would ever utter. Um, you look ahead to Gideon, a judge, and uh, God works in and through him to take on 135,000 with just 300 men. Even last week, we looked at um, a pagan nation, a pagan uh, king of Naaman, and how God offered healing to him if he would trust God and trust God to heal his, uh, his leprosy. And so we've been studying and working through these, these examples together, and even throughout this series, we're also just trying to show you how Scripture throw, flows together period by period. We looked at judges and how God would raise up judges to lead the nation of Israel. And then the nation of Israel kept growing and growing, and Israel was like, we want a king. We want a king. And God was like, whoa, you have a king. I am your king. But they're like, we want a, we want a physical king. And so God granted them that wish and provided, provided kings for the nation of Israel. And the first one was Saul, and that started well but didn't end well, which led to King David, which started the line of Jesus. And then we see in Scripture that as that continued, kings would come, and a king would go, and a king would come, and they would do evil in the sight of the Lord, and the nation of Israel just kind of fell apart. Things were really bad. Eventually landed them in a divided kingdom. You had the northern kingdom in the southern kingdom, and then you have a period of silence where God just stops speaking for 400 years, silence. And today, we are going to pick up the story right where God speaks again for the first time. And today, we're going to study and look at the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Mary is an amazing example to all of us of what it looks like to be fully devoted to God, to trust him with the details and with the plan that don't make sense to us, that we don't you know, in our minds aren't able to see, but yet God can do some amazing things. And so we're going to look at her story. We're going to pick it up in Luke 1, verse 26. Hopefully you're already turned to the Northridge Church app and you have the sermon notes in front of you. But we're going to look at Luke 1, start in verse 26. It says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So pause for a second. Who is Elizabeth? So Elizabeth is a family member of Mary. And Elizabeth and her husband struggled to get pregnant while they were young. 
So God, in an amazing way, comes to Elizabeth and her husband and says, you're going to conceive and you are going to have, have a child. And this child is actually going to be John the Baptist. So we see Elizabeth, she's in her sixth month of pregnancy, and God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So here we're introduced to Mary, and we see here that an angel comes to Mary. Now we have to understand the, the context here. Like when we think of angel, I think sometimes because of culture, we think of like a, a bald, chubby baby on a cloud playing a harp. That is not what angels look like, okay? <laughs> that is not the way the Bible describes them. In fact, they're described as fierce, like warlike uh, creatures. And they, God, at, at the command of God, God could say, hey, go, go strike down an army. And they will go and they will strike down an army. They're also tender and submissive to God too and could come alongside an innocent child. So this angel is actually one of two mentioned in the Bible. There's Michael, the archangel, and then there is Gabriel. This is Gabriel, and we see him appear to Mary. Verse 28, this is what he says. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. So he's in a really good mood today. Like, that's a really positive, like, open air, right? You who are highly favored. He's friendly. The Lord is with you. So what's Mary's response? Is she, like, excited? Like, sweet, I've always wanted to meet an angel. This is cool. No, she is completely disturbed. Verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary responds, verse 34, she's like, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Right, so right away, Mary's figuring out, and she's trying to piece together this plan, and she's realizing, there's some holes in this plan. <laughs> you see, baby and virgin, that doesn't work, right? That, those, those things don't, don't go together. The odds are not in her favor that this is going to work out well. And let's step into her life even a little bit further. Right, because we know that she's engaged to be married to Joseph, so she's, you know, a young woman at that point of thinking about her future and excited about that. And, you know, what are, think in our modern world, what would, you know, a young woman who's getting ready to be married, what would she be doing? Well, she'd probably be on Pinterest, right? And she'd be scrolling through Pinterest, looking for ideas and creative ways to make her wedding beautiful and memorable and fun. And She's probably practicing signing her new name, you know, just trying to get that just right, you know, for all the checks she's going to sign at her wedding day. And perhaps she's even starting to think, you know, like, man, if we have a boy, what are some, what are some boy names that I like? Or if, you know, eventually we have a, uh, maybe a, a girl, what are some girl names that, that we have, right? Th this is the world in which God, through Gabriel, is stepping in. And Mary has these plans probably to a certain extent mapped out. Right? And she's trying to figure this out, and the angel responds, verse 35, and he says, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be, um, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I gotta imagine for Mary, she's probably in this weird spot, weird mix of emotions, right? Like on one hand, like excited and honored and like, wow, God would choose me to be the mother of Jesus, the savior of the world. But then on the other hand, like total fear and panic and like, my life is going to be a scandal. <laughs> no one's going to think or look at me the same way. There's going to be shame. People will just, what do I do? There's got to be just both sides back and forth. And not to mention, she's going to have to tell Joseph, <clears throat> Imagine how that conversation would go, right? Like, hey, Joe, are you sitting down right now? You're not going to believe this, but I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> what? Like, how does that work? Well, I don't know. You know, but you imagine just what she's trying to wrestle through in her mind in this moment, yet we see in verse 38 this incredible, amazing response from Mary where she says, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So we see just in this one verse an incredible trust-filled response from Mary. Despite all the unanswered questions I'm sure running through her mind, she responds with trust. In fact, we see her trust in three ways. Right from verse 38, 
we see her trust in three ways. The first is this. She says, I am the Lord's. Before she says anything or responds, she reminds herself of who she is and whose she is. She's saying, no, I, I'm the Lord's. And he is my leader and my master, king of kings, lord of lords. And what that means is my allegiance, it's not to myself. My allegiance isn't to any other person or nation or ruler. My allegiance is to God. And, and he is lord of my, my life. So she is saying in, in this statement of trust, I am the Lord's. The second thing um, that we see where she's declaring her trust is she says, I'm a servant. I am the Lord's servant. So she reminds herself of who she is, but then she says, look, I am not here um, to be served, but no, I am called to serve others. And if my God is calling me to do something, man, I will step out and I will trust him in it. Even though I don't understand it, I can't figure it out. This is going to cost me. This is probably going to be harder than I can ever imagine. No, he is my Lord. And as a result, I am called, I'm going to serve him no matter the cost. And then number three, the third way we see her trust, <clears throat> she says, I'm going to follow your words. Mary says in one of the most faith-filled statements in all of the Bible, may your word to me be fulfilled. She's saying yes to a life of sacrifice, a life of uncomfortability. This would be a public scandal most likely for her. People wouldn't look at her the same way, but yet Mary trusted God's word more than any other person's word around her. Whether she liked them or not, whether she understood the full plan or not. In fact, we know Mary didn't understand the full plan. And as we look throughout the New Testament, you look at Mary's life and Jesus, you see her realizing this plan as it unfolds before her very eyes. Just two examples of that. We see when the shepherds come to worship Jesus. We see this in Luke 2 verse 15. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So we see Mary, Mary's taking all this in. Like shepherds are coming and worshiping her child and word is spreading about Jesus. And we just see her, she's treasuring this. This plan is unfolding before her eyes and she's just taking it in as she watches God, God work. We also see another example of this at the dedication of Jesus at the temple. And uh, there was a man named Simeon, and the Holy Spirit had actually come to Simeon and had told him, look, Simeon, you're not going to pass away. You will not die until you see with your own eyes the Messiah. And we see Simeon meeting Jesus in Luke 2, verse 27. It says this, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light uh, for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So again, we see Mary and even Joseph like seeing this plan come to fruition right in front of their eyes and they're taking this in and they're pondering it. And uh, we know they didn't understand the full plan. And they learn that over time as they watch God just show his plan before them. And that's, I think, right where God wants us. Right? For some of us, we want to know A through Z. You've got to give me the whole lineup here, God, the timeline, the what, the why, the how, the when, before I'm going to step out in faith. But oftentimes, God just gives us A and B and maybe C. And then it's like, are you going to trust me with these steps? And as you do, I will, I will show you and reveal my plan to you. Do we truly trust in him? Because that puts us in that posture of, of trust that we're dependent on him. And I think Mary, Mary's a wonderful example to us of our theme verse that we have been coming back to each week throughout this series of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but rather in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. In fact, I wonder if Mary would have memorized these verses as she was, you know, carrying Jesus and the mother of Jesus. I mean, she probably would have heard um, these verses read to her or taught to her as she was growing up. But I wonder if these were words that she treasured in her heart as she was stepping out on this journey full of unknowns 
to be the mother um, of Jesus. But she's a perfect example of what these verses look like and what they, what they mean. And I think as we look at Mary's life and example and what it means to trust God, there are so many things we can learn. There are so many practical observations and takeaways that I think can help us right now, wherever you find yourself right now, that can help you know what it looks like to trust God. And so I actually just want to pull a couple of these principles and observations out that I see here from her story that, again, can help you, can help I right now today think through what does it look like for me to trust God in the season of life I'm in right now, in the chapter of life I'm in. The first one I see is, is this, is that God's interruptions are often inconvenient. Right, it's bad timing. I got a full week. I got a full plate. My kids' schedules are really busy. At work, I got so much going on. I just don't have time, God. I'm, I'm sorry, God, it's bad timing. I mean, think about Mary. What God was asking her to do was incredibly inconvenient. Right, this was, this was gonna disrupt her entire life. But yet it leads us to this next, this next point or observation is that what we call interruptions God often sees his invitations, right? Those times that, that we feel like God is interrupting me, often he's actually inviting us to something different, to something greater, to something better, to something beyond our, ourselves. And think about this series. Every example we've looked at each week was someone who had some sort of plan going for their life, but then God interrupts them and he invites them into something better. And they choose to step into that and to trust God in that. And I believe there's many of us and we often shake off God's invitations as interruptions when God wants to work in and through us in ways that we, we may not uh, have recognized before. And I don't know how this is going to play out for you, but I believe that if you are sensitive enough to see what might be an interruption as a possible invitation, then God will do something great in and through you and through your life. And it could ha happen any number of ways. And I'm sure some of you have already your own interruption invitation stories. And, and maybe, maybe for some of you, it started a couple of years ago when you started a new job. And you started working at this, this company and it wasn't long before you made a friend and one of your coworkers. And uh, you became friends with them and you began to realize that they go to church and they go to this church called Northridge and they love their church and they're always talking about it and they start inviting you to, to come check it out, starting a new series or come on Easter or Christmas and they're inviting you, but you say, you know, you say no initially, like, man, my, my Sundays are, are busy, travel a lot. I just, sorry, I can't, I can't do it. But, um, but they keep inviting you because that's what Northridgers do, right? Like, we love to invite people to Northridge Church. So they keep inviting you, and finally you say, all right, okay, I will come, but you pretty much are only doing it to get your friend off your back, to appease them. And so you come and you show up, and uh, you're thinking, man, all right, I just got to bear through it. I just got to get through this hour and then I'm, you know, I have to come back anymore and, you know, I get my friend off my back. And so you, you come and it's not long into the service when you realize like, all right, this, this isn't what I thought. This is all right. These people are kind of normal. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, you like, you continue and then maybe it's, maybe it's a song or maybe it's a, a part of the message where you start to all of a sudden feel like, man, something's happening on the inside and, and, and God is pressing in and you sense him at work in your heart and in and in your life and you walk out of there like man okay that was that was pretty cool that was neat and so you keep coming back and you come back a couple of more weeks and then finally you actually get to the point where you recognize who Jesus is why he came and uh, what the significance of that is for you and for me if we place our faith and trust in him. And so you do that. You place your trust in him and you ask him to be the forgiver of your sins and leader of your life. And now you have this new faith in, in Christ. And it's not long after that, you know, maybe a couple weeks later where you find out one of your coworkers is at home sick. And um, they're home sick, recovering. And uh, you have this kind of burden inside of you like, man, I should just swing over and just drop off some tea or a, a meal for them. You know, just you know, just try to encourage them. But you're quickly like, I got a full week. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I have time. But that nudge doesn't go away. And so eventually you're like, okay, I'm gonna do that. And so you swing by after work to see your friend and you drop off a meal to them. And as you are there with your friend, talking with them, you realize that there are words coming into your head and out your mouth that you didn't even know were there. And you're speaking incredible words of life and healing and encouragement into your, into your friend. And in that moment, you're realizing like, whoa, God, God is working through me in a way that I, I didn't see coming. And you leave that place on like the spiritual high of like, 
whoa, God, God used me to be an amazing, powerful encouragement to my, to my friend. And so you continue in your faith journey, maybe a couple of months later, you're, you're at Northridge Church and you hear on Sunday they're talking about serving and opportunities to get plugged in. And you're kind of like, that'd be cool, I would like to do that. But then you're also like, I don't know that I can give up another hour on Sundays, I'm already busy enough. And the service continues and that, that nudge doesn't go away and so actually the service ends and you, you're walking out of the auditorium and you actually find yourself at next. And then the next thing you know, you actually find yourself talking to someone. And then the next thing you realize is you're signing up to serve four-year-olds in our kids' ministry. And you don't even like kids' men. <laughs> and so you start doing this and then you're like a couple of weeks in and now you're realizing, like, God, you know what? The greatest hour of my week is that hour where I get to impart spiritual life into these young kids. Right, what happened? How did your life go from where it was a year or wherever to where it is now? Well, God interrupted you. He stepped in and he invited you to something different, something way beyond yourself and to something better. And what we call interruptions, man, God often sees as invitations, which leads us to this next thing, that God's purpose, purpose is often different from your plans. I don't know how this is going to play out for you in your life, but when God interrupts you with an invitation to something else, you're going to discover his purposes and his plans are often way different than yours. I know I've seen this in my life a number of times and probably most clearly in what I'm doing right now as a pastor. If you were to ask me in high school, in college, even after college, if I ever saw myself being a pastor, I would have said no. No, not that I had anything against it, but that was just not the career path that I saw for myself. And for me, it was all about sports and athletics, and that was the direction I wanted to head, and that was the direction I had. Um, after college, I coached soccer and taught at a school down in Pennsylvania. Did that for a few years. My wife, Emily, and I, we got married, and then God opened an opportunity for us to do college ministry. And so we stepped into that, which brought us back to Rochester, where we served with the local colleges and universities here. And uh, we, all, that also brought us to Northridge Church. And we fell in love with Northridge. And we got super plugged in and invested here. And we were serving here. And it wasn't long into that as Northridge Church was growing where um, with some of the staff I had a conversation where they had said, hey, have you, have you ever considered like joining staff as a pastor here at Northridge? And, and I said, no, I really haven't considered that. Um, and then I made the mistake of saying this. I said, if there ever was a church I could see myself as a pastor and it would be Northridge, like we love it. Well, that led to another conversation and wouldn't you know it, last week just celebrated 10 years on staff as a pastor here at Northridge. Like, it's crazy. And I, the whole reason I say that is just simply because that was not the plan that I had for my life. But as we know, God's plans are often different than our, our plans. And I don't know how that's going to happen for you, but you're going to see it, and opportunities are going to come. It may be that you dreamt of having the perfect, healthy family, but then you find out you're actually going to be having a child that's going to be born with special needs, and it rocks your world, and you have these questions, and you have these doubts of like, what did we do? Did we do something wrong? Why us? Why not them? And how is this going to be? But you have no idea the blessing that this child is going to be to you and to so many others and how through this child, God is going to bring you so much closer to himself and you're going to experience love inside of you you didn't even think was possible. Why is that? Well, it's because God's plans were different than yours. Maybe you lost a job one day and you were thinking, man, this is the worst day of my life. What am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? And you're trying to find another job, but just nothing is turning, turning up. And so you actually decide, all right, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark and start a business based off a hobby or a passion that, that you had when you were younger. And now you look back years later and what was once a curse is now the greatest decision you ever made in your life. Why is that? It's because God's plans were different than yours. We see this so clearly in Mary's story. She was willing to see God's invitation and was willing to trust him, even though his plans were way different than her plans. So I think this leads us to, to a, just an important question that I really want each of us to just lean in here for a second and just think about and ponder this question, and it's this. What is God asking you to do? Right now, in the season that you are in, the chapter of life you're in, what is God asking you to do? What is he asking you to believe? 
And if you're a follower of Christ, I believe this with all my heart, that God wants to be involved in your life in a very real and intimate way. He wants to be a part of shaping your life and molding your life and leading your life and directing your life. So what is he leading you to do? What's he asking you to do or to believe? And for some of you, boom, it's going to come. And you're like, I know. I know what it is that I need to do. For others, it might take you a day or two or a week of asking God and praying, God, what is it that you're calling me to do? And it's going to come. And for some, it might be to start a ministry that God has given you a heart and burden and passion for in your city or community. Or maybe not to start one, just to join one and to get involved in your community or city or church. For some of you, it's to care for people that have significant needs. It's to care for the refugees, the homeless in our city, or get involved in the foster care system. For some, it might be to restore a relationship. There's a relationship that's gone south. God is nudging you to take the first step, regardless of what they have done, but to own your part and to lead out in trying to heal that that relationship. For some, it might be just to be more generous with your time, your gifts, your talents, whatever it might be, just to be more generous. For some of you, you've been struggling with an issue and the struggle that you've had, but you've been keeping it all to yourself, thinking, I can carry it, I got it, I'll figure it out, but the burden is just too heavy to carry, and God wants you to open up and to share that struggle with with a trusted friend. For some of you, it's to get baptized. We got open baptism coming up. And if you're a follower of Christ and you haven't been baptized, that is what God desires for you to do. For some, he may ask you to go back to college, get that degree. For some, he might ask you to change your major halfway through your college career to something else. For some, it might be to reach out to someone that's far from God and you've tried and you've tried, but they just didn't want anything to do with it. But God is saying, hey, don't give up on them yet. Keep pressing and keep reaching out, keep investing, keep building that relationship. What's God asking you to do? And then when you get ready to respond, always remember this. Outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is yours. Right, but what about this? And how is this going to work out? And what's the timeline? And what? That's, that's God's responsibility. That's, that's the outcome. Obedience is ours. And we simply surrender ourselves just like This young woman did some 2,000 years ago, Mary, when God interrupted her life but invited her into something way beyond what she ever thought or dreamed possible. And I believe today God is still all about divine interruptions and divine invitations. And will we be willing to step out and trust just like Mary did? And will we remember her amazing response from verse 38? I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And when God interrupts me or when he interrupts you uh, with something that's inconvenient, I hope we can step out and trust in faith into what he has for us. And why is that? Well, it's because we trust in the Lord with all our heart. We don't lean on our own understandings. No, we acknowledge him. And when we do that, he is going to lead and guide and direct our steps. And that's my hope and prayer for us as a church, that we would be a trust-filled church, a trust-filled church people willing to be used by God as he sees fit. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for your word, for the examples that we see all throughout the pages, God, that that show us what it looks like and what it means to truly trust you. And I pray, God, that you would give us that courage. I know it can be hard and I know it can be intimidating and fearful, but yet I, I pray, God, that we wouldn't allow those things to keep us from what you want to do in and through us. Um, in our lives and in the people around us. Give us that boldness and courage, just like Mary had to step out and trust um, the plan that you have for our lives. Pray this in Christ's name, amen.